it so. In this video, we're going to be covering the TL70 shifter assembly install, as well as all the remaining pertinent information that was not included in our bell housing install video. There is still a bit of information that needs to be covered, which is why we made a separate video. Let's get right into it. This transmission is going to require the use of an RB25 flywheel with our crank adapter ring, ARP flywheel bolts, and a Subaru 230mm clutch disc. One of the first things to point out is this machine taper built into the RB25 flywheel, which is not present on the factory L flywheel. If you're on a real tight budget, you could have a machine shop machine this material out for clearance, but I'd imagine it would be at least half of the cost, if not 75% of it, compared to just buying the RB flywheel upgrade kit. Of course, if you bought a complete swap kit, all of these parts will come with your swap kit already included. The reason we're using a Subaru clutch disc is due to the difference in spline diameter. The Nissan disc uses a 24 tooth 1 inch spline, where the Subaru disc is a 24 tooth 0 .990 or something close to that. Point being, it's big enough of a difference for us to address, and it will give you a visual representation here. This is the Nissan OEM clutch disc, same spline count, roughly 10 thousandths of an inch larger, but look at the amount of deflection we can get. Also, it may be hard to see on the video, but I can also get a degree of free play from left to right when twisting. I guess you can say maybe around one to two thousandths of movement, which I'm not too fond of when we compare to the Subaru disc. This is the Subaru disc, and you can see right off the bat that it is a much tighter fit. I have virtually zero deflection between the input shaft and the hub splines. Uh, the only deflection I'm getting is really from the input shaft bearing, and that's normal because we don't have a pilot bearing supporting the front of it. I can't take full credit for this test as Derek at Dotson Works actually is the one that came up with this test and suggested I try it, and after I did, we both agree you need to have the Subaru disc installed. Luckily, it will fit right into the RB flywheel so long as you utilize ARP flywheel bolts. You'll notice the ARP flywheel bolts have a much lower head profile, so they don't protrude as far out toward the clutch disc as the OEM ones. The OEM flywheel bolts will hit the clutch hub and damper springs, uh, where the lower profile ARP bolts do not. Now that we have the clearance issues worked out, let's talk about the RB flywheel adapter ring. We've sold quite a few of these over the years, and believe it or not, this was actually the first official Godzilla Raceworks product. So the back of the RB crank is approximately 1mm larger in diameter compared to the L engine. Even though the flywheel bolts will technically do a good enough job of centering the flywheel when torqued to spec, they were never intended to be the load bearing fasteners in that regard, the crankshaft was. So our adapter ring will center the flywheel over the crankshaft and keep it centered and let the bolts do their job clamping. One thing that we do need you to do is actually trim the starter shield around the footprint of the starter. The RB flywheel is backspaced about 1mm further towards the transmission compared to the L flywheel. And we've seen accelerated ring gear wear because of that. Even though 1mm doesn't seem like a lot, trimming this portion of your shield will allow the starter to engage that much more and keep it from wearing out. You can trim this with a sawzall and a vise, a cutoff wheel, or if you have access to one, a vertical bandsaw. After trimming your shield, your starter will bolt directly to the bell housing itself now. Moving on to the shifter assembly install. If you're using a used transmission and it came with a factory shifter assembly, you can remove the bushings from the old bracket and reuse them on our new bracket, and they're actually very easy to install. Our video will be specifically covering our complete kit, which features the Cusco Delrin shifter base bushings. You can see here on the shifter base where we added a slight chamfer to the bore entry so that it doesn't snag during install. OEM bushings fit right in without a whole lot of persuasion, maybe a pair of pliers and that's it, but these Delrin bushings are another story. Now might be a good time to go ahead and loosen these 6mm Allen bolts to allow these horizontal brackets to be able to move during the installation process. With the Delrin bushings, we found sticking these in a freezer for 15 to 20 minutes to allow them to contract helps aid in installation. So go ahead and stick your bushings in the freezer. While we're waiting on those bushings to freeze, let's remove this drive shaft dust shield from the back of the transmission. These will be on all new TL70s and some used ones depending on the year, but it's not needed in this application and it actually hits the shifter fulcrum on both the OEM shifter rod and the aftermarket torque solutions unit that we use. You can use a small hammer and a chisel working it evenly from both sides until it pops loose. Next we need to install our shifter flex joint. This will not be included in any new TL70 you buy so it will need to be purchased separately. The last two units we bought used did come with them, but there are no guarantees. We provide this already pre-installed in all of our complete swap kits. The base of the shifter flex joint has two little recesses cut in them that we'll go over in a minute. Also note the roll pin, the crush collar, and two shifter pin bushings to be installed later. You'll notice those two slots I mentioned, those are for the crush collar to be beat into the recesses on the side of the flex coupler, and it'll keep that collar in place so the roll pin can't back out during operation. 
The roll pin just slips in place and is loose to allow a flex coupler to move left and right. Lastly, the collar covers the roll pin to keep it from slipping out, and then the crush collar is staked in place. Put a little bit of grease around the fulcrum joint on the shifter select shaft so that you're not gouging metal to metal in there. What I like to do is I slide the crush collar in first, and then you can bring your flex joint in and then install the roll pin. Once you have the roll pin seated all the way, slide the crush collar all the way back onto the flex coupler. Once you have done that, you can take a hammer and a chisel and stake the crush collar into place so it can't move back. You need to hit it with a decent amount of force to crush the collar, but don't beat the hell out of it. The crush collar should not be able to move backward by hand with a considerate amount of force. For now, let's make sure the transmission is in neutral, as this is going to help out when we do the shifter base later. Now that your bushings have been in the freezer for a while, we're going to make a special tool out of a long bolt or a stud and a few washers and a couple of nuts. This will be used to press in our Cusco Delrin bushings. Loop up the bores in the shifter base, then grab your bushings out of the freezer and loop them on the outside as well. Get them chucked up in your makeshift tool and tighten them down. If you have an impact gun, this will really help you save time. If not, doing it by hand is fine too. If you get some small chunks of Delrin coming out, that's okay. Just pick them out of your way. After we get the bushings installed, these specific Cusco bushings end up out of round on the inside boards once they've been pressed into place. I've reached out to my vendor to see if they can make Cusco aware of this, so maybe the future ones won't have this problem. But for now, we're going to need to ream the bore out with a 25 64 drill bit to get that inner diameter perfectly round again. Just run the drill bit back and forth a few times, stopping periodically to check to see if your shifter base pins will fit in place. If it doesn't fit, keep going back and forth with the drill bit and recheck. If you end up taking too much material out, it's not a huge deal. You should be able to slide the pin in and out with one or two fingers, so that's how you know that the hole is rebored properly. Now you can install your OEM shifter pin bushings into the shifter flex coupler. These are also not included with the new transmission and need to be purchased separately. You can use a large pair of channel locks to carefully press these into place. Just don't forget to add some grease before you start pressing them in. Now to give you a visual reference of those OEM shifter base pins, they are side specific. There is a small locking tab that engages a piece of casting on the transmission case and it locks into place once you have the shifter base installed. Let's get the shifter base installed. Go ahead and lube your shifter base pins with some grease and let's get one side lined up at a time. This is where having those large 6mm allen head bolts loose will aid in this installation. If you find yourself not being able to get the pins all the way in, you can use a hammer to lightly tap them into their final position, but don't get carried away and break the transmission case. Light taps, anything more than that and you're not lined up properly. Loosening those shifter bracket bolts that we talked about will help you move it into place. You're going to get that rear pin bore lined up with the pin. Once you get that in place, the other side is exactly the same. This is a good visual reference of the back side of that shifter pin bore. It has to line up with another part of the transmission case. So having that ability to move and tweak things on the shifter bracket helps a lot. Once those are in place, the bushing should not be under any load. You should be able to rotate the shifter base pins until you hear an audible click. Once you click them in place, they're locked in place. They shouldn't go anywhere unless you're going to service the shifter base. Go ahead and retighten those two 6mm Allen bolts in the shifter base. You can give it a few light ugga duggas with a 3 8 inch impact gun. Just don't send it to the moon and you'll be fine. Now we need to get the back of the shifter base secured to the transmission case. We need to drill a couple of holes with a quarter inch drill bit, and we're going to use the shifter base bracket as a drill guide. Get the shifter base bracket as level as possible. It doesn't have to be any precise rocket science, but just use some common sense. Keep the drill as straight and as upright as possible. You don't have to drill all the way through initially, just use the shifter bracket as a drill guide to get a pilot hole started. Once you have your pilot holes located, rotate the shifter base out of the way and drill those holes all the way through the aluminum case. Now you should have a selection of spacers to choose from. Uh, the smaller spacers here are for use with the OEM TL70 shifter. The taller spacers are for use with the Torx Solutions short throw shifter and possibly others as the fulcrum point hangs lower. And without proper spacing, you run the risk of contacting the drive shaft during operation. These spacers will set the installed height of your shifter base bracket. Depending on what shifter you're running with, select the spacers for your application. All of these bolts need to be coated with red Loctite to keep them from backing out. We've seen all kinds of transmission hardware come loose due to the vibration, so just as a precaution, apply red Loctite to all of these threads. Now it's time to connect the shift link bar. you notice a small U-shape machined into the driver's side of the shifter base. This is to allow for in-vehicle servicing and allow you to slide this pin in and out from inside the car, as well as get some tooling in there to access the pin. 
We have a small run of these brackets that don't feature this recess. If you have one, it's not the end of the world. You can either machine or grind down your own recess into place. You can send it back to us for machining, or you can move forward without it. This is not a deal breaker for installing the link bar, it just may be a little bit more difficult to install while in the car. Let's get the link bar installed. There is one end with a welded pin, and there's one end with a spacer built onto it. The side with the spacer faces the driver's side of the transmission, and has a free-floating pin installed through it. Don't forget to add a washer to the pin, and then lube the pin before you install it. You can get the pin started partially in the link bar, and then grab yourself a pair of large channel locks and slowly squeeze the pin into place. This may be a lot easier on a broken in or used transmission with the bushings already installed, but since all of our parts are new, they're a little stiff. Just work slow and steady with that pin and slowly press it into place. When you get to the last 3 eighths or so of an inch, watch out for the pin wanting to poke through the other side of the flex coupler. Adjust your channel locks so that the nose of the channel locks are not actually covering this hole and keeping the pin from sliding all the way through. Once you get the pin driven all the way through, install your washer and your cotter pin to hold it in place. Now you can take your shifter out of the box. If you're using the Torque Solutions shifter, it does not come greased, but it comes with a bag of grease. Take as much of that grease as you can and pack it into the ball socket to lube it up. Don't forget to lube the outer o-ring here as well. Feel free to work the joint around a few times to circulate that grease into place. Once you get it lubed up, we're going to drop the shifter into its base. Note the bend at the bottom of the shifter, the bend faces the rear of the transmission. Set it into its bore on the shifter base, and while holding the black bracket clamp on both sides, apply even downward pressure to get it to seat into place. Now install a washer and lube the fixed pin on the link bar, and partially install it into the shifter fulcrum bushings. At this point, while holding the link bar in place by hand, you can push the shifter forward locking the transmission in third gear. Having it in this position will give you the most room for popping a link bar pin into place. Now take your large channel locks and squeeze the pin into place. You're just trying to overcome a little surface tension here, so give it a decent squeeze and it should pop into place. Once it pops into place, it should float freely. Now install your washer and your cotter pin and we'll move on to the reverse lockout adjustment. The reverse lockout is a small plate that installs on top of the shifter plate and keeps the reverse lockout knob from traveling too far and engaging reverse instead of first gear. Now if you don't have this adjusted properly, you could end up possibly downshifting from second into reverse instead of second into first gear. So follow these instructions carefully to prevent that from happening. Go ahead and lay your reverse lockout plate with a lockout lug facing the driver's side of the transmission. In the shifter box there are four 4mm Allen hex screws. Go ahead and put some red Loctite on the threads and thread all of those all the way down finger tight or very lightly with a Allen key. Leave enough slack to slide the reverse lockout left or right for adjustment. From here you're going to put the transmission in second gear and slide the reverse lockout plate to where it's touching the reverse lockout knob. Back it off about an eighth of an inch so you have a little bit of gap and tighten all of your shifter plate bolts down. You want a small gap to account for things like bushing wear, the force you're applying to the shifter rod, etc. If it's too tight, you run the risk of not being able to actually locate first or second gear. Once you get all of your bolts tightened down, do a quick function check and make sure that you can get it into all of the gears. Once you've done that, give all four of the shifter plate bolts a final check for tightness. Lastly, I want to highlight the reverse lamp switch on the TL70. If you're buying a complete kit from us, we'll take the time to convert the harness to plug into your existing Datsun wiring. However, if you're piecing together your own swap, the transmission will actually come with these two connectors in a small bracket. The brown connector doesn't get utilized, so we'll tie it off and out of your way. The gray one is for your reverse lamp switch. We will cut the Toyota connector off and crimp a couple of bullet connectors so they'll plug into your Datsun wiring harness. These are female bullet connectors and they can be found at any O'Reilly's or AutoZone. The last piece of the puzzle is the transmission cross member. It's pretty straightforward and there are two L style brackets with bolt holes that utilize the tail shaft housing case bolts. Once those are in place you can install your insulator bushings which have studs that mount into the secondary cross member. From there, these utilize your factory transmission cross member bolts and in your parts box you would have gotten four thick washers that you can use to even out the spacing for the factory mounting points. I hope this was as informative as we intended it to be across these two videos. If you haven't caught the video for installing the bell housing, please feel free to check that video out as well so that you know exactly what you're up against if you're considering doing this swap at home or in a shop. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to comment in this video or reach out to us directly over email or calling the shop. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks again for watching.